for being. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, today I rise to speak to a matter of great concern to working families across Bean and more broadly to millions of workers across Australia. Before entering this House, I worked as the Director of Professionals Australia, advocating and representing science and engineering workers for more than a decade. Prior to this, I managed industrial relations at the Australian Federal Police Association during the Work Choices era. My experience of both of these unions tells me that this government's approach to industrial relations change is wrong. Labor's simple test for the government's approach to industrial relations reform is how they deliver secure jobs with decent pay for Australian workers. Instead, what we have is an approach that enables the cutting of wages and conditions. This really shouldn't be a surprise from the party of the HR Nichols Society, the party of work choices. And Deputy Speaker, the government has had two months to change their approach. They've had two months to say that they're not going to go ahead with it. And what have they done? They've left their approach completely as it is. It is a slap in the face to many workers, including those that have worked so hard throughout the coronavirus in essential industries. The government's approach will allow for the cancellation of billions in back pay that without this, le without this legislation would have been owed to miscategorised casuals. Furthermore, the government's continued extension of simplified additional hours increases the threat time the threat of part-time work casualisation into the future. It looks to normalise decreased job security with these simplified additional hours being able to top up hours without appropriate compensation. Most critically, this will see the removal uh, of the better off overall test. It speaks volumes for this government that they see value in workers' new agreements not meeting the better off overall test that as we move out of a pandemic that so many have suffered through, they see benefit in allowing paying conditions to go backwards. Deputy Speaker, even before COVID-19, the growth in insecure work and wage stagnation were major issues for Australian workers and for our economy. The pandemic exposed the fact that too many people in this country work in low paid, insecure employment. Casuals, contractors, freelancers, labour hire workers and gig workers. These vulnerable workers, the ones who can least afford it, were first hit and the hardest hit. Rather than taking this opportunity to learn the lessons from COVID-19 and dealing with the twin problems of insecure work and flatlining wages, some of the measures contained in the proposed new laws do the opposite. If passed by Parliament, this would give business a green light to cut wages and conditions by allowing agreements to cut penalty rates, shift allowances and other entitlements. This approach is the answer from the Liberal National Government to the problem of insecure and low paid work. This is the thank you to the workers who got us through the pandemic. Cleaners, supermarket workers, truck drivers, childcare workers, aged care staff and many other essential workers on the front line put themselves at risk to keep the economy going and Australians safe. But under the proposed new laws, they could actually end up taking a pay cut. When the government facilitated cuts through penalty rates for retail, fast food, pharmacy and hospitality workers, it failed to deliver a single extra job. But now we're expected to believe they're cutting more penalty rates, cutting overtime, cutting shift loading, cutting allowances will create jobs. Australian workers know they cannot trust a Liberal National Government with their wages and conditions. We've seen it before. It's what they always do. It's what they're doing now. Cuts to paying conditions are bad for workers and bad for the economy. For Australia to recover from the recession, we need people with money and the confidence to spend. Deputy Speaker, in decades past, Australian Labor governments have taken global upheavals as a chance to reset and recalibrate the national direction. Prime Ministers Chifley, Hawke, Keating and Rudd chose to reform elements of the nation for the better. This stands in stark contrast to the opportunistic attempt to weaken the workplace paying conditions for working Australians, many of whom have been the real heroes of the pandemic. And Deputy Speaker, if you want a real insight into the motivations of this government, consider how they treat their own workforce. Deputy Speaker, many in this House won't be surprised by the government's approach given the way they bargain with their own hard-working staff and the broader public service, including federal police employees. 
Deputy Speaker, way back at the end of 2019, our staff sat down with the Department of Finance to start the bargaining process for their new enterprise agreement. Despite a bargaining policy that limited any real bargaining, staff across all sides did their best to find improvements until bargaining was suspended due to the pandemic. This suspension was agreed to by all staff around the table, and I'd like to thank the staff of MPs and senators right across the country who worked hard to support their communities during the pandemic. Bargaining did resume eventually, with finance being encouraged back to the table and they put their final offer forward. Despite staff from all sides seeking some modest improvements and a rejection of a pay freeze, these simple asks were rejected and the draft EA was put to a vote late in December 2020. Not only, not only was this a cynical attempt to push a vote just before Christmas, given how hard our staff had worked, the offer itself was a disgrace. Fundamentally, the EA froze wages for all our staff for another six months after pandemic delays and tied salary increases to the private sector wage price index, an index that could lead to an actual wage cut. The vote on the EA was expected to be tight, after all, an agreement had not been voted down since 2003. But, Deputy Speaker, the result was anything but. Close to 60% of the staff voted down the agreement. The results indicated that not only did Labor, Green and Independent staff reject the offer, but so did many coalition staff. They also know what is in their employer's DNA. Frankly, the offer was an insult to the hard work our staff do across every office, and I call on the government to take note of this result and return to the table with a better offer. Deputy Speaker, as I mentioned at the start of this grievance debate, I also once represented our federal police through the Australian Federal Police Association. And like our staff, they too are negotiating a new agreement. Their current agreement is in need of reform. At the moment, uh, situations arise where when operations are extended beyond five days, officers have to be, officers have to be rostered out. Some officers have found themselves on effectively a 36-hour continuous shift. Our officers are some of the lowest paid in the country. There lies within the agreement a perverse incentive to stay on the front line or in higher risk areas for longer. And attracting expertise into the AFP is becoming increasingly difficult. The AFPA knows this and have offered an olive branch to try to address some of these issues. Federal Labor recognises that the varied roles and responsibilities of the AFP re re require a flexible enterprise arrangement, one which ensures that the important work of the AFP gets done, but done safely. Unfortunately, instead of taking this offer of genuine engagement, the government has locked the Australian Federal Police into the same constrained bargaining policy with clauses that make it almost impossible to trade off those difficult measures I mentioned for productivity improvements and fair pay, and it locks staff into the same floating WPI index. It's disappointing that after years of declining wages growth from this, from this government's mismanagement of the economy, that they are now asking AFP members to pay the price through lower wage increases. I'm also concerned by the apparent lack of consultation that went into this new policy with key public sector unions, including the AFP Association. Members of the association have written to me outlining their concern about where they think the government is heading with their bargaining policy, and I want to ensure them that I get their frustration and will be advocating in their corner to get this poor bargaining policy off the table. It's, a, it's essential that all AFP employees, especially those in high volume and complex portfolios, are adequately recognised and compensated for the important work they do. And it's also important that the AFP has competitive industrial conditions to not only attract the right talent, but to remain a premier law enforcement agency. Finally, Deputy Speaker, as I said in a previous life, I also spent work time working with scientists engineers and also medical professionals, including, including many of the dedicated staff at the Therapeutic Goods Administration. One of the main, one of the main grievances these great professionals had was the lack of commitment to same in political life to evidence-based decision-making. In a year where we've seen the differing consequences from either respecting and acting upon expertise or not, it is not just sad but irresponsible that the Prime Minister continues to not rein in the member for Hughes.